Hey guys, welcome to a drama diving. Uh, we are going to have some guests with us in a little bit. Uh, we got a couple things we're going to talk about real quick. First, today's topic: the rapid descent to the bottom. Basically, what's going on with the dive industry? Short classes, cheap classes, just pushing people through and out. Uh, so, the the topic kind of came up. Uh, a bunch of people have been talking about it. I had been stirring it around on social media and stuff for a little bit, and. Um, then we, you know, I saw a couple people talk about some things and we're going to have uh, Eric Fine and Nicole uh, Zellick, uh, join us in a minute. Uh, first off, uh, I want to thank all of our Patreons. Uh, I threw a, a link up to the Patreon. It helps us do a lot of different things. Um, one of which is tasting different whiskeys, but we will bring them to the next time like Dima's around or something on the dive shows. We will bring whiskey, especially to help our Patreons out that are helping out, us out. So we'll have a whiskey party next time. Um, I know the New England guys would definitely like that. Uh, so, and then also the, uh, Glen Karen glasses and everything are up on the shop. You'll see it in the, uh, the products, featured products area. One of the big things we want to talk about really quick is we are going diving this weekend. If you are in the New Jersey area, we got a couple spots left on the boat. If you want to jump on with us, um, we're on the independence too. And if you want to get one of those last couple of spots, uh, it's posted up in that same shop link. So we'd love to have you come dive with us. And uh, that's one of the things we'd like to do in the future is do some drama diving, uh, whiskey slash diving, probably in Scapa would be a great idea. So uh, without further ado, uh, we are going to get started and chat with Nicole and Eric. And I think a couple of people might join us a little bit later on. Uh, they got caught up doing some things. You know how life is. So um, welcome, Nicole and Eric. Hello, guys. Hey. hey, what's going on? How are Hello. you? Good, yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good, good for a Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah, I know, right? It is, right? Exactly. It's uh, How's the weather down by you guys? Or well, over by you, Eric, down by you, Nicole? Mm, chilly. So chilly? This is my end of the dive season anxiety. The colder it gets outside, the more I think about how cold it will be in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Eric, you? Uh, Massachusetts, we're, we're kind of all over the place. We're in like the 40s, the 50s. and I think we're going to be 70 tomorrow. So we're, we're in that weird fall time of year. It's beautiful, though. Nice. Excellent. I love it. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and pour myself a little bit of whiskey so we can get started chatting. I'm sure there's going to be some commentary popping up here. Oh, we have new comments already, so we'll see what's going on. Um, James Comfort says, hello. I uh, I took a page on Natalie's book, and I started writing down notes earlier. Um, so lots has been said about this topic in general, and lots have been going around on the Internet. Uh, and it's been the discussion, uh, lots of different things, and, and I'm sure there's some hornet's nests we can stir up. Uh, but the general idea of the fact that the dive industry is – Go, oh, Dave wants to know what I'm drinking. Belveni Caribbean cask. So 14 year. Um, I forgot. I always start with that or they ask and we won't get off that topic <laughs> until we get rolling. All right. So, uh, and Nicole's got water apparently. I think. Just water. Is that your, is that your pH balance water? Yeah. Um, I don't know why I, I, I drink tap water too. I started testing these and most of them are just tap water. <laughs> Eric, what you got? Uh, high whisk whiskey. Nice. Well done. All right. Now we got that out of the way and we can get deal with all of our drama diving people. Now we can get on topic. All right. So um, we are looking at shorter classes. We are looking at cheaper classes. We are looking at people not joining our sport or joining it quickly and then leaving. Um, and maybe we can do better. Well, yeah, we can do better in dive education in general. All of those things we, we can definitely do better with. And, and I think I've seen weekend classes for like a couple hundred bucks. You get start on Friday, done on Sunday. Like what? Like, I don't understand. I don't understand how that that's uh, sustainable in our industry. Uh, Nicole's opening thoughts on that. I've got to kind of run down what we're going to do, but your opening thoughts on this whole scenario. All right. It's not sustainable, <laughs> but um, it's, I don't think, oh man, um, we, we're going to unpack a lot tonight, right? We're yep. going to unpack mm -hmm. whether or not we have more divers coming in, whether they're all poorly trained. Um, and thing is, I do agree with you. We do need better dive education. Um, my, the summary of what I came here with tonight is 
rethinking what it means to be an entry level diver in today's day and age. And I think that that's the solution to this whole okay. dilemma we've got. Fair enough. For Eric, sure. open thoughts. Uh, when I got certified in the, oh geez, the 90s, it was a 12 week class, six pool sessions, six classroom sessions. It was a lot of in pool time before we even touched the open water or touch confined water. And it, you want to be comfortable. And, and when I start, when I got it, it, now with the weekend classes or even like, you know, the two day classes, it's insane. People, you have to be comfortable first before you can get in the water. So I think Nicole's comments great. It's that beginning diver. And part of it is you want people to enjoy the sport, to continue it beyond class, beyond that one trip to Cozumel or Bonaire, wherever they're going. And I don't know if it's an industry thing or what, but they, people just want to like, Get them in the, get them in the shop, buy a bunch of gear that they'll never use again, get them trained, and then say, okay, have fun. But that shop then loses all of the excitement of that new diver. They totally let it go and disappear. And I've never understood that. Some shops really harness that and want to encourage local diving, and other shops are like, no, no, local diving is horrible. Let's all go down south or somewhere warm, which I think is a real shame because depending where you are in the country, you might not have that ability to do that or the finances to always go travel for diving. Yeah. And that's one of the things that kind of came, it might've been great type podcast. that was talking about like the, the difference now that, that uh, you, you see with, you know, it was a great dive podcast of, you know, everybody was pushing travel, 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 but no one pushed local travel is all Caribbean warm travel. Cause that's what the, the, the instructors or leaders wanted to do. And they shunned away from the local diving cause they had done a bunch of it. That was what they had said. So that kind of opens up, let's go down this pathway of, the traditional model of the dive shop or dive industry. We heard that the traditional model needs to go away. There's a uh, one guy that basically said he should live on a van down by the river and that's all he needs from the diving industry. And that's like, <laughs> quite literally like he basically teaches out of a van down by the river and like, he's like, I'm God's gift. Like, okay, well, no, that's not the, the solution to our industry. That's not sustainable. I get what you're trying to say. Like, it's not all that complicated overall, but we have an industry that actually has to sustain like you selling the cheapest gear possible out of a van, sending it to the, it's not going to work out. Um, but the traditional model, uh, we sell travel, we sell um, gear, we sell uh, classes, we sell experiences, we sell all these things. And each shop, what I've seen is a lot of shops will focus on one area and then people will just shop the cheapest portion of that. And everybody fails mm -hmm. because each person's going, oh, this person's got the really cheap travel because they're going to sell them the the stuff, the you know, and the the people that are going to say, I'm going to sell them the stuff. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do really cheap stuff because I'm going to sell them the travel. It all just implodes because people shop around. They're, they're smart enough to do that. Um, so thoughts on the traditional model. We'll go back to Nicole. Thoughts on the traditional model of the dive shop. Should it change? Does it need to change? Or how are we going to handle that whole damn thing? All right. Um, if this is the traditional model, this is what I think of it. All right. <laughs> that works. <laughs> <laughs> um, I relate to that guy that you said lived in his van and had a scuba business out of his van. Mm -hmm. Um, I relate to him because my scuba business is in my kitchen <laughs> and in my car and in my garage and my backyard. And every time I trip over, yeah, well, um, that being said, you, uh, hit the nail on the head. Um, dive shops are expected to be uh, travel agents. They're expected to be equipment sellers and ed educators um, and experience makers. And quite honestly, I don't think that it's really possible to do all things really well because you're going to spread yourself thin and you're going to compromise your experience in one area or another. So my dive shop model is a little unique. Maybe the dive shop model 2.0. I don't have a retail store. I, I don't have a physical location. I partner with one um, and I take care of their experiences, the education and the, um, and the travel. Why? Because I don't want to touch equipment and I, 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 I break it every time I touch it <laughs> and I'm not good at selling it because I just don't know it. So I really don't want to deal with it. Um, I know that's not the uh, way that everybody does it, but uh, I definitely think that it's freed me up to not, it's freed me up to not push gear on my students and to not worry about that. So that's kind of 
where I, I and I don't intend to open a physical shop and deal with gear. So fair enough. So what is your and I was hoping to get there. What is your business and what is your business do overall? Like how you kind of hit on, hit on it a little bit, but can you explain it a little bit more? Um, quality education and experiences. So um, you uh, so these trips uh, we organize quite a bunch of them. Oh, my, my business is Super Dive Scuba, based mm -hmm. out of Queens. Um, and um, we run trips, we run courses, but uh, I think that I'm part of the, my courses are really good club because I take a lot of care into making them, crafting them into experiences. I, I, won't, I won't bore you guys into uh, too much, but I was a game designer uh, coming out of college. So uh, a lot of my courses are gamified. Nice. That works. Oh, um, all right, Eric, you go ahead and answer that question. And while you're doing that, tech's going to come in and say, hi, <laughs> what's up tech Clark. <laughs> so I, right. I guess, from, I guess from a, a dive shop perspective, having worked in a shop years ago, it's, I think, the shop really valued at the time education. I think, and the sh and the shop on Long Island still probably does now. I think that's where people are getting away from. If the student who knows nothing about diving, maybe sort of on the Discovery Channel or sort of in a magazine, they want to try it, they're going to go into your shop, and they're going to look at that that instructor as that is the person that is the ultimate penultimate expert at what they're doing. Like if you're in skydiving, you're not going to go to the dude that pays you fifty nine bucks to jump out of a plane. You want to find someone that knows what they're doing and they're an expert at it. And I think I in think the dive I, industry. Interject. He'll go to him once. Yes. <laughs> you're right. Once. Probably go to him once. <laughs> exactly. I think in the dive industry, even if you look at the names that we give people, instructors, dive masters, master scuba diver, you create this kind of, for the new uneducated diver, they look at up to these different levels of like, once I attain these, or even at, even as simple as advanced open water, they look at it as I am now an expert in my field. And it's really not, they're not, there's so much you don't know even at the, I'd say even at the dive master level or at the instructor level, because you haven't experienced that yet. So from a dive shop perspective, yes, uh, the dive shop has to be the travel agent, the gear expert, the master instructor that knows everything about every type of diving in the world. And, you know, they have to know local travel, they have to know everything. and. They have to recommend the right gear and they have to fill your tanks. They have to do everything in between. And I don't think shops can do all of it and do all of it well. I think you have to kind of pick and choose your spots. Like there are shops that are tech shops. There are shops that are recreational shops and they need to focus on what their core competencies are. Good. Uh, tech, first off, uh, Brock apparently is now paying attention. He was just here. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't paying attention to at all. Thanks, Brock. Um, <laughs> So the question was the traditional model of dive shops. Is it sustainable? How do we, uh, where's, where are we, where are we going in the future? How, how can we make this a little more sustainable and do the right thing? It's a really good question. It's <laughs> one that has been with us for decades because uh -huh. this is not new. Yep. Um, what we have seen is that since the sixties, the training standards have continued to deteriorate amongst the agencies. Um, and so when you start to look at it in that sense, you know, one could argue that, okay, with e-learning, we've reduced the classroom time. Okay. I understand certain logic behind that. But now what we're seeing is a massive shift within the amount of contact hours that happens with a student. So training is declining. It, that's a fact. And when you start to look at the amount of boat captains that are out there that are saying, we have to do more rescues than we've ever done. We have, when we pull off the fins and where they're handed up to the boat, we feel more mucus than we've ever felt in our history mm -hmm. because the students are <laughs> the divers are literally on the reef. Mm -hmm. And when we start to have these type of, uh, of challenges that go on and people that cannot get down that downline and they are holding up an entire line of divers because they can't equalize their ears and they have no congestion. They have no nothing. They just haven't learned how to equalize. That's egregious, and that's what we're seeing right now that's taking place. 
And I think that there's a lot of problems that, that come to play when we start looking at the model that has been rolled out and, and you ask about the, the sustainability on that in a dive centers model and a business model. Uh, Nicole's right, it's absolutely not sustainable. And so why? Because what it does is it's damaging the brand of scuba. It's damaging our entire sport. And what happens is, as I've said many, many times, all you gotta do, I'm here in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale, all you've got to do is punch up Craigslist or OfferUp. Just go on one of those here in Fort Lauderdale and you will see tons of scuba equipment for sale. And we're not talking little pieces here. There's some of that, yeah, but there's full sets of gear. And when you read the description, what does it say? It says, used once, used twice, used three times. So I've done my own little anecdotal research on this. <laughs> and I've it. reached out to people and said, hi, I'm interested in your scuba equipment. Why are you getting rid of it? And you know what the story is? Scuba is not for me. I can't equalize. I can't equalize. I can't equalize, uh, you know, other pursuits, not comfortable. I mean, you cannot believe the stories and the stories relate back to their training. They were sold a bunch of equipment. They were not properly trained. They're not comfortable diving. And all of a sudden here they are leaving our sport. Mm. I have a yeah. problem with that because mm. I'm passionate as all we are here, Nicole, <laughs> Eric, Jason, and everybody listening, we're all passionate about this sport and to watch people leave because of what the business side of our industry is doing. Mm. That is an egregious affront. And that's where I have a problem. And if you take a look to comment on what Eric was saying, um, Darcy Kiernan with um, the Business of Diving Institute, Bodhi, when you look at Darcy's presentation or his, um, his blog on that a dive shop is seven businesses in one, mm -hmm. think about that. It truly is seven businesses in one when you've got a, a school that's on you know, the <laughs> education side, but right. then you've got also... A technical thing, well, uh, excuse me, um, a repair, a repair unit. The repair unit is like a mechanics shop, total different business model. Then you've got a travel agency over here because you're going to go run trips. A travel agency is a completely different business model. A rental agency, completely different business model, right? It just goes on and on and on. And it's the seven areas that he's identified. And you're right, Eric. People are not a master in all those areas. They wind up being a master in one or two, and that's about it. And uh -huh. not only not only can you not do all seven well, I know I can, but not yeah. only can you not do all seven well, it's also a massive amount of liability, which for any business totally. owner is ridiculous. You look at your insurance costs at the end, and you have to pay for gear, and it's just too much liability. Like, uh, you're definitely set to fail. Mm -hmm. You, you you totally are as a shop and and it, you know it, especially if you're in, in a non warm weather location outside of Florida or California like in the Northeast unfortunately I think a lot of people think of diving as a summer activity which is unfortunate because there's, yeah. there's a beautiful local diving and also there's winter and cold water diving and I think we had talked about this offline but training new divers they go in ill fitting wetsuits ill fitting equipment they're thrown into their open water or their confined water sessions in really crappy conditions for them. So your first experience of outside the pool is zero visibility or less than optimal visibility and bad fitting equipment. Why would you want to continue with it as a sport? If this mm -hmm. is your first experience that, you know, and like I've talked about, like try them in a dry suit first out. They don't know any different, you know, get them comfortable, get them in the water, spend a little bit more time in the pool with them then that first experience outside of the pool, they're gonna maybe have a better time diving. And then maybe they're gonna continue on. They're gonna wanna be part of the local dive scene, which will get them meeting divers to become buddies and do the travel. But if they can't travel, they can go on the weekends and join the local dive club or do the local dives, which might be even more fun than those trips to Cosmo once a year. That's, uh, and I, I know you know, Eric, but that's what we we started doing dry suits from day one. We got rid of, well, we have our wetsuits there on the top of a shelf, um, but we are all dry suits. We have full racks of dry suits and everything's dry suits. And the response we've gotten from our students is through the roof. Oh my God, this is so fun. Oh my God, I'm so comfortable. This is great. I love this versus 
the first thing that before was I'm cold, but that was fun. Instead, now it's right. just that was fun. That was fun. That was fun. It used to be, uh, you know, I live in the uh, as Danny Rivera says, South Canada, um, but uh, <laughs> upstate New York. But yeah, so that's that's been that's been a major change for us. We spend a little more time at, at the beginning, and I always talk to my students. I'm like, well, I actually told my students this week. I'm like, it might not be as much fun because we're setting a foundation. Like we're trying to build this house. We're trying to set this foundation. Yeah. It's not gonna be fun for like not gonna be amazing from day one. And they came out of the water. They're like, this is amazing. Like, oh, that was not the response I was expecting. But the, okay, this is great. Like, and it's been yeah. it has been a blessing. And you're right, Eric. Is it's just, it's not all that much harder to teach in a dry suit. Like they just get it. They pick it up. It's, it's automatic. You tell them generally and you go through the safety stuff later on. And it's been a, a massive change for us. Um, and the point is to try and get people to locally dive and dive more and more and more locally and, and stay in the sport. Um, and to text point, I was trying to find an article. There was one that, um, that was floating around and I, I was looking for it before we got on here, but it basically was like why people leave the sport. And it came down to comfort after, diving like that's it they took their class they're not feel they don't feel comfortable they went to do a, a dive and they just don't know what to do and they don't feel comfortable um, but i can't find it again to to put it up there and prove my point but that's that eric you were going to say something i believe uh, I, I was real quick i was just going to say that you know and it's in i've seen it in the industry before but we put these mythologies around things like a dry suit or a back plate in a wing for some things we make these things like this is a really large leap for a diver to go into a dry suit or a back plate in a wing or something that's not standard or something that's not what the industry wants to push. And, and the, at the end of the day, it's all really simple. We just put these, make these things scary for people to move on to that next level. And and I don't, I've never understood that. Maybe it's the margins on things. Maybe some in the industry want to keep pushing new types of gear so that diver has to buy new gear every time they progress to another level. But at the end of the day, it's diver comfort, it's being having fun in the water and just having fun period. Cause then you can enjoy your dive and you can want to dive more. Well, here's a question for you, Eric on a back plate and wing from a brand new diver. How long does it take to explain to them fully and fit them? How long do you think it takes to fit a, and have them be able to make adjustments if they need to. So they fully understand it. Having gone through it myself recently it takes about a yeah. couple hours to do to do it yeah. well. Yep. To adjust, and, but that, whole time I went through it in a, in a backplate fitting, I guess, if you want to call right. it, you had the discussion with the instructor, you understood why they're making those changes. You did the dives and you could feel the differences every time we tweaked the backplate mm -hmm. and the, the way the harness felt. Yep. And it was and that's an amazing what I'm getting experience. At. That's the difference is uh, my backplate and wings, 700 bucks or my BCD, 700 bucks. I can hand mm -hmm. you a medium and you can walk out the door or I can spend three hours for the exact same, like you said, markup or whatever. I, and I appreciate the contact time. I, I love backplate and wings. I love the fact that we replace single pieces of them, that I can really get somebody in trim and dial them in and can really fit them if they grow with it. I'm a big fan of them. I sell regular BCDs too. Plus, one of the things that we found, um, and we're trying to combat it now, is the overwhelming sense. You walk into a dive shop, all this gear hits you in the face. You have no clue what to do, and you've got well, there's a thousand dollar package. I'll just take that and walk mm -hmm. out the door because now I, now it's tangible. I can just grab it and go mm -hmm. versus, all right, we're going to need three hours to set this gear up and we're going to make sure you're in the right stuff. Some people that scares them or is that's not what they're interested in. So, um, so anyone have anything to add to that before I go to next? Well, not really next topic, but interject off of that. No, Good. I think, okay. I think, I think we've all agreed that we need to divorce the, 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 the dive shop business model needs to kind of split up a little bit. Right. And but, figuring out how that goes is, is a very complex, like tech said, it's been, it's been decades essentially of the conversation of where are we going with this? Um, I guess it gets back into how do we keep divers diving and how do we get new divers? How do we do that? And, and with, with or without the traditional model, how do we get new divers and how do we keep people diving? So I think we kind of answered, but. Um, so I've come armed with some statistics. Go right ahead. <laughs> because... I appreciate it. I was looking for some, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm I'm a DEMA member, so I, I just get all these infographics and stuff. Um, I, your question was, why are people not diving anymore, right? Um, why are why are some divers leaving the sport? Where how can we keep them in? I'm trying. And how to, do we get more divers? 
I can't find the exact I can't find the exact document right now, but um, the top two reasons I, I don't have the exact percentages, but the top two reasons that people don't dive as much as they want to is um, reason number one was that it was too expensive. Mm -hmm. And reason number two is that they don't have time. And those are the two biggest issues. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's a little bit with the modern day consumer time uh, not only are are people poor <laughs> but um time is super valuable um and that's an issue right um because you want on one hand you want to offer these courses that are amazing courses but an amazing course is not going to be a three-hour course right but how uh i watched a friend of mine lose business to a neighboring shop they drove many miles away from his shop just because there was another shop that did the course quicker and he lost several, several customers that way. Um, and we want to provide quality, but how, how do we reconcile today's mm -hmm. consumer with what we want to provide? That's, that's a great question. I, I think part of it is where are we targeting? Are we targeting? So is, if you look at diving as an industry, who do we compare ourselves to? Are we looking to compare ourselves to tennis and golf where you can do the one hour with the instructor and now you're free to do what you want, hack as many balls as you want? Or do we look at ourselves as skydiving or other activities where should humans really be either underwater or flying through the air, right? I mean, at the end of the day, being underwater is not a place where humans should be without some type of support life support system right and i don't think we sell ourselves in that type of a framework we say anyone can dive and unfortunately i i don't think everyone can go diving i think a large population can but not everybody technically um but also this is where it comes to the the comfort level in the water that's where i think it comes to how that instructor is set up to say this yes my class will take more time but at the end of the day you're going to feel comfortable in the water be it in your equipment being in the in in the water and and you're going to enjoy yourself at the and i think that's the most important part we lose the for the new diver the joy of diving because if they're not if they're scared while they're in their first out of class experience they're going to maybe do it once or twice or for that trip or maybe that first local dive but then they're going to sell their gear and they're going to be like, hey, I tried it. It's my bucket list item. I checked it off. I'm going to go try something different. And as an industry, we don't understand that piece of it. We want to put ourselves in the tennis and the golf component. But I think we're too specialized of a sport and too expensive as a sport. I mean, I, I in my 40s now, I couldn't see myself getting into diving in my 20s. The cost of diving has gone up exponentially. But we don't explain to people that this isn't an, an investment, but at the end of the day, you're going to become a happy diver, a better diver, and you're going to enjoy it for years to come. We don't sell that part of it. I think we want to sell it as get in the water, get in, get out, get certified. Here's your card. And now go walk across the roof. Like we don't care at that point. So, we don't want. So I don't think that. Um, so right now the industry is suffering. Uh, every end by that, I mean, we have less entry level divers every year since 2017 we've been on a decline so i and um we are we only target affluent people to come to our dives because right now a certification costs a lot so mm -hmm. not everybody can scuba dive um about and i've got statistics but uh we are not diving is a very exclusive sport um it um, about 68% of divers make 150 K or more and less than 2% make under 50 K, which is the median income for, for example, New York city. So and we all are, 2 are dive shop owners. <laughs> 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 Sorry right. to call. <laughs> no, I, you, I mean, there's no lie there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, we do not want to raise the barrier to entry any higher because then we're not going to have anybody coming into scuba. If we make this thing any more expensive or um, make any more, you know, we want to sell quality courses. We don't want to undervalue our services or otherwise our dive businesses. We won't make any money at all. So 
I've taken, I've taken a little bit of a radical approach with my business. And this is the part where I'm going to lose you guys because I'm going to say a word that's very stigmatized and you guys are going to be like, oh, we can't do that. But I have changed the entry level. Um, I don't, I don't believe in starting people off at the open water diver level. I think that people should begin with a supervised certification. Um, if you look at the RSTC international standards, there's supervised diver. And then the one that most people start as your course number one, you call up a shop and they'll sell you a, an open water diver course, which allows you to dive usually up to 60 feet unsupervised. I don't think the low standards of training are the problem. I think that everybody signing up for this course that ends up with you being unsupervised after what, like four, you know, these weekend courses and these people should not be unsupervised. They should be, they, they don't do their refreshers. They'll sell their, their, they'll sell their gear in a year on Craigslist and tech's going to buy it. <laughs> and, um, and so kind of if, if we rethought where these people started off and they started off with these supervised certifications, it doesn't mean that the certification has to be low quality, but uh, then you get to supervise them and that creates some more work for us dive professionals to do. So that's kind of my, my business model in a nutshell. I think you can un unpack it now. <laughs> no, that's a, that's an actually an excellent idea. I think there's a mentoring component that I think in the in, I think early on in the dive industry there was a mentor component to it, um, and that's kind of gone away. I I've been lucky to have several mentors across my diving career, I guess. And I, I don't work in the industry anymore, and I'm, I've never been an instructor, so I'm just the guy that goes dives on the weekends and has fun. So I don't tr I've never really trained people, um, but I think there's I've been lucky to be mentored by certain divers and had the ability to dive with some really amazing people that have taught me through just experience what to do. Um, but I, I think having that supervised component is huge. I think as a new diver, uh, looking looking back today where I was as, a, as an open water diver, there's, there's stuff I did that I would never do today. I, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I would never have done it. But I think having a mentor then would have been huge. There's still things today that I'm unlearning that I learned back in the day. You know, my buoyancy, my trim, when I first got certified, it was on the bottom, you know, kneeling on the bottom, doing all your skills on your knees type of type of open water training. Now, if you can do all that horizontal trim in the water column, and that's huge, but I had to unlearn everything to get to that point. And I think as an industry, if we can explain to people, that's where the fun comes in. If you're comfortable in the water and you're having fun in the water, then you're going to see that lionfish on your dive. Or if you're in a local quarry, you're going to see that object underwater, or you're going to see that fish, or whatever it is you want to see, you're going to see it and remember it and be able to tell your friends who didn't go diving that day what you saw and get them excited to maybe try diving. And that's the part that I think we miss. And having a, a supervised diving certification, I think, is a great idea because when you get out of the water, Instead of a shop saying, hey, congratulations, here's your open water card. I want you to go sign up for your advanced open water class. And here's a thousand dollars in classes I want you to take. Let's get them excited to just enjoy where they are at this point. Maybe it's a couple of 30 foot dives. Maybe it's, hey, we're going to go to this beach site. There's about 20 feet of, of diving, but you're going to have fun. Everything we did in class, you get to do it for fun. And I'm not going to judge how you are in the water. I just want you to enjoy outside of class. And I, I think that's a part we miss. We want to get people to that, or there are shops that want to get people to that advanced open water level and then that master diver level. And I think, and that's probably due to a business model constraint, but I think from an industry perspective, we need to get people to be just comfortable in the water first, having fun, and then get them to a point where they want to progress and grow as divers. Tech. You got some. I saw you're writing some stuff. I'm assuming you got. Some <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just. There. I'm just pontificating. I apologize. That's it's perfect. Just, that's what the point is. <laughs> it's just flowing, and as it's flowing, I'm like going. Wait, I got a I point. Flow. Okay, wait, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Same. Wait, there's so many things to really t discuss here. First of all, I want to echo what Eric's talking about about the. Uh, the human body is not meant to be underwater. So if it's not meant to be underwater, what do we have to do? It's technology and techniques. That's the only thing that keeps us alive. 
So when we need to explore that and teach that, then there you go. We create standards, we create curriculum that allow people to use the equipment to stay alive underwater. Now, staying alive underwater, thriving underwater, and enjoying your time underwater are two different things. We can talk about don't hold your breath, and you don't hold your breath, okay? But that doesn't mean that you're great at equalizing or that you're great at neutral buoyancy or that you're comfortable underwater with a mass clear when your mass starts to leak during a high current dive. So because of all this, the more training that takes place and the more of the variations of skills that take place, the better. Now, I'll go to a very high industry level aspect to what you're talking about, Nicole, on the supervised dive. When you're talking about what the ISO standards are for the RSTC and the WRSTC and how that relates to supervised dives, you've got to remember that the standards that are given on a supervised course are less than an open water dive. Not so if we're much. all talking not, about not but if much. we're all talking about right now, that the standards for open water divers have been absolutely reduced down to something that is, you know, unconscionable from the 80s. Now you're looking at even less than that is supervised. Now what happens is that now the person comes out with a tether. They must be tethered to a dive professional for their dive. Now, does that mean that every time they go diving, they're going to learn something new because they're with a professional? Maybe not, because there are places that require you dive with a dive master and there's places that do not. Now the person goes out diving and if cost is one of the reasons it's a barrier of entry or continuing in the sport, now we're gonna add a $75 or higher dive master fee on every trip that the supervised diver wants to go on. It's part of the reason why supervised diver certifications have not gone anywhere. It's not because we haven't sold them that way. It's because it becomes a burden for the diver. Then what? They have to upgrade their certification. They come back for a second class to just get open water diver. That's where we start to see a second barrier of entry. So I'm not thinking that that is actually a really good uh, method to keep longevity. What you were saying though about creating an atmosphere that's very encouraging and very supportive and very enthusiastic and almost mentoring. I love where you're coming from, but you also have to remember this. There are dive boats that you've been on where the dive master is the village idiot. I hate to say it, sounds very unprofessional. No, it is. You want your student that you could have taught to be an independent diver by just doing everything right. Do you want so, your student now tethered to the village idiot so on a dive boat? Here's my, here's my, I see a lot of scuba instructors and I see a lot of them teaching their open water students. And no matter what agency you are, you still have, I mean, you can't spend, you know, a month with a diver. I, I don't I don't really trust that many people once they're off. I, a lot of these open water divers I really think should be supervised. And I, I, I don't know how many hours I would have to spend with somebody before I know that they can go off and be unsupervised. Um, at well, least you mean it, for, your, your, for your own divers? Well, for just watching all these people, we're, we're talking about dive shops churning out la large classroom numbers um, and if you have your standard dive course right now, which Jason says is large numbers, a few hours, and all those people are getting open water certifications, I, those people should not be unsupervised. Those yeah, but people remember, should be supervised. But remember, as an instructor, we're the mentors in the industry. So we are the ones that are turning the people on to diving and we're giving them the skills and the tools to be able to move forward with their their passion of diving. And so, so as why we do we do that, why do we insist that these people start off unsupervised? To me, it feels like going to pilot school and insisting that when a pilot starts flying an airplane that they can be in that cockpit on their own. Whereas in flying, your humans are not meant to be in the air. Yeah. You're, I, you're I supposed you're to have saying. another pilot there with you. 
Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Nicole, but you know, from the, the perspective of either a retail environment that I've taught in or a university environment that I've taught in, both worlds, it's all about that the student has to have mastery of the skills. And the only way they get mastery is the way that you teach. And so there are some students that I have said, I'm sorry, you're not ready for the open water. And because of that, we need either remedial training or you can get a lesser certification because you haven't met the qualifications. There are some people that just shouldn't dive. There are some people that are just slow learners or need more concepts. But the big thing is, is that it's you know incumbent upon us as instructors to be able to bring that person up to mastery. Once they've got mastery, I tell you what, I've taught literally thousands of open water divers since 1988 thousands. I sleep really well at night. And the reason is, is because I've trained them to the level that when we go to the checkout dives, I'm not questioning whether they can be in the checkout dives. When we're on our checkout dives, they're rock stars. And if they're not, they don't get a certification. If they bonk on those dives, they don't get a certification. That's what preserves the integrity of our sport and our industry. So I went sell yourself short on your ability to train up great divers and just know this, that that dive shop down the street that's doing a couple hours of pool training and the people are coming out horribly trained and they can't do anything and they're going to leave the industry and whatnot, you will not change that dive shop. Hmm. The agency might not even change that dive shop because they're not even on the agency's radar about if they're violating standards or whatnot. And so the deal is, is that then we cannot enforce that the industry mandates that everybody is a supervised diver because in the legal aspect, and especially as it relates to all of our professional liability insurance, an open water diver must be in control of their own dive, regardless of what the dive master says on the boat. You have an one hour bottom time, be back at this time. The dive master is not leading that dive. And so when a dive master is in the water with the student and there's an accident, guess what? Now you've got the whole forensic side that says, well, who is in charge of the dive? It all depends. When we took an open water diver and open water diver has been trained to all the levels that they need to do, that's less liability on the dive master. If we do partial certifications, it's more liability on the dive master. So there's a lot of things that are just really challenging about that that should be considered. I think that one of the myths here is that the supervised diver standard is much lower than the open water uh, standard. And the truth is, as somebody, I'm literally designing a, a curriculum based on it right now, it is almost identical to the open water course. So much identical that Patty, for example, does not have a, a scuba diver e-learning. They just use the same e-learning that the open water divers use. So I think that we need to, um, Danny Rivera up here said that um, low, we can't have top notch super professional classes at rock bottom prices. And I beg to differ because we have technology here. We have um, a lot of people don't like e-learning I design interactive e-learning and I can vouch that it is amazing top-notch education and I can sell it for low prices. Um, we have different, yeah. But my contact time on an open water class is probably 60 hours total. So the after, That's all, my, the, after all of my expenses, I make about negative $5 an hour. <laughs> So, so legitimately, I, it is. I am at a loss at every single open water diver, but that's and, what it takes to make good divers. And I am more. Expensive but it's not than everybody. sustainable. It's not, and I'm more expensive than everybody in the area. When you start so, talking about whether it is less expensive or more expensive, it is perspective perceptive. Your consumers of, don't have time, and they don't care how good you. Uh, okay, you will get the consumers that do care how good you are, and they will choose you. So and, there. Are customers then there's a customer that has no time and wants the quick and easy in out instagram story and then you've got the other consumer who wants to be a member of the sport and continue on we've chosen to focus on the people that want to be a part of this sport and want to stay in and we are okay with people paying extra money and but i thought that you said you're not getting money no there's they're, a whole they're, they're demographic of 
there's okay, I get it, but there's also a whole demographic of consumers that you're turning away because they're not going to be those serious, really good divers. Imagine right. that a skier, if they decided to take up skiing, uh, the ski instructor, or there was some kind of pressure on them, you must end up being this good at skiing, otherwise, you are not a skier because that's what I'm hearing here. Um, I'm hearing you there is a certain skill level that you have to be to be a diver. But the, yes, and that's, that's that's us as professionals, but consumers, scuba is just one of the five activities, right. the hobbies that they do. Right. So I, I we have a standard that we want them to hit. And when, if they hit the standard, then they become certified. If they can't hit the standard, not interested in hitting the standards, then we don't want them to, like we, we would encourage them to do something else. There, there's other things, but we have a set standard we want them to want to accomplish and go from there. We have, we are okay with losing some customers that don't take it seriously. We had to give up on Groupon because all we were getting is people that had zero interest of actually spending any money in the shop, right. zero interest in doing anything except for a, the cheapest possible, quickest experience ever, and then just be done with it, which meant that the people who wanted to be serious divers and lifelong divers, we had to take our time away from them and spend it with the people who just wanted the weekend and the quick, easy, cheap, Version. But those people were in the same class, right? They all came to you for an open yes. water certification. Now so imagine we, that you could give those guys the class they want, and then your serious divers the class that they wanted. But you and said I that dive shops can't do seven different things, and now we're splitting our We're just talking about education. Right. We are but just talking about different thing. courses. In the education, you've got the instructors. You've got only a set number of instructors and good instructors. We're talking about good instructors. If you want a set number of good instructors, we need more of those. And we have a lot of village idiots in, in this industry that need to get out. And we are pressed for really, really good instructors. We're, we're talking about just instructors, not people who uh, are instructors and sell equipments and travel agents. We are talking about people who are just instructors. They should be able to teach an entry level diver, a supervised diver, and they should be able to teach a serious diver. So um, I would argue at a hundred dives, no one should be considered a scuba instructor in the dive industry. Yes. And I, I, I think <laughs> that let, let's go all the way back to the very basic piece. I think at 20 dives, you can technically start your dive master training, which at the end of the day is becoming a tank monkey. Let's be real. Dive masters in most cases aren't more than just like a TA or fill in tanks. So, and I was a dive master. I got the card and I basically fill tanks all day long. So that that's where I so that's my personal experience. I think at a hundred dives, when I hit that mark, I knew two percent of what I of two percent of experiences in diving. There's no way at a hundred dives I felt comfortable training anybody, be it a cert, a supervised diving certification in open water or an open water certification. I I like the concept of open water, but I, I think of being supervised in that initial post go live or post go post-certification diving piece. I think that's, I think that to me is a, almost a mentor. I think we have to build upon that and make people mentors because a lot of, you don't know what you don't know. And I think as an industry, we again, go back to the, how we name people, advanced open water, master diver, you know, dive master. So if you don't know, if you're just a basic diver that goes on a trip or even locally, here's your dive master. You've got master in your title. They think you know everything about diving. If you're an instructor, they think you know everything about diving. You're going to train them on everything. You're going to make them an excellent student. But at the end of the day, if I have 100 dives and I have instructor after my name, I know just what I know after 100 dives, which if I'm in a quarry for 99 of those dives, I know what it's like diving in a quarry. So I really don't have that experience to give to that student. And honestly, I'm shortchanging that student. You I did one know. dive 99 times. You didn't do 99 <laughs> times. One yeah, dive they, 99 times. And that's when I went to become an instructor. I did one dive 90 <laughs> times. And I almost killed myself so, in North Carolina because I was told I could dive anywhere because I could dive up here and I almost died. So, <laughs> let, let, so it, go ahead. I blew Deco. I, I blew Deco. I had no clue what it meant. Oh, I was on no. the boat. I double dipped. And the only reason I did it is because I was told if I can dive in the Northeast, I can dive anywhere. So I went to North Carolina. The current switched. I blew Deco because I didn't know what it went meant and I should have been dead. So. so so let's actually talk about exactly that, where you thought that you were qualified to dive and then you learned real hard and fast that you didn't. Um, yep. 
I, I there was a question from I, th I believe John. No, it was about being uh, yeah, John. In the water? John asked, "Did you guys think some newly minted divers are actually scared to dive without yes. an instructor?" And oh, to yeah. that note, here's my embarrassing story. I was, I think, a dive master. I, I, I had just finished my rescue diver, and I was starting my dive master. And that was the first, I went to Dutch, I did everything in the Caribbean. And then I went to Dutch Springs as my first dive, my dive master. And I didn't realize that I could dive without an instructor. I'm doing my dive master and I'm looking around being like, well, who's going to go in with me? And, and I didn't realize that my open water level was supposed to prepare me to plan my own dives and be self-sufficient. So it's not your fault, Nicole. That's the fault of the instructor that actually taught you from well, the day it wasn't one, one your instructor, instructor should have said that was that three courses. By the end of this course, you will be able to dive on your own. I won't be there for you. You need to be a great buddy to the other person that you're a buddy with. You need to be able to successfully complete all your dives. I will not be there to handhold you. And that's why from day one, we have a whole policy of you don't even touch the students unless it's necessary yeah. for an emergency. You I let them correct policy. every problem and do everything. So, no, you I can't wanted to, go I wanted to with clarify the, my that position. mindset. I wanted to just clarify my position because everybody, I think Danny thinks that I'm selling my time for cheap and that I don't have, you know, that I'm giving my customers a lower quality experience. I just wanted to say that Eric, I think, got it. I'm only advocating for adding another step to the ladder. I think that there's a missing rung on the ladder and I don't think that we need I don't think that that step has to be a low quality step. I, I think it you, needs Nicole. to have a very high quality course education. I hear you, Nicole. And let me point this out. Since you brought up skiing, what would it be like if you went through a ski, in, a ski school and you came away from your lesson and said, this lesson, you will still have to die, ski with a ski instructor. The rest of your time on the mountain, you're still going to have to ski with a ski instructor. Who wants that? I, if I didn't, so, 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 so I just. Do your students actually want that certification? That it's not about what you want. You're missing. What no, do the students want? You're missing the, the, the point. You're, you're saying to me that this diver is now nailed to the cross of, I have to dive with an instructor. No. If they want to, they're going to take another course, which teaches them how to be, how to plan their, and, and the course is a little different. That's it two courses, on dive which planning. is a barrier to entry. You, you can still, I can either sell an open water dive course for let's say a thousand dollars, or I can sell a supervised, uh, okay, I'm giving you numbers. What, 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 what do you sell your, your course for? 375. So, all right. So let's say that's the open water course. I can spend uh, $200 for the entry level supervised diver certification. And if they want to, they can upgrade it for $150. I am Is not it saying more time. No, it's not. It's exactly the same thing. The super exactly the same thing as open water diver. So now yeah. you're talking the same price and you're talking the same amount of time. I'm saying splitting it up. And now the person has to go through two separate courses. They just have to, to split get up the, the time. end product. That's what you're arguing right now. Supervised diver, it. supervised diver is two dives, and open water diver is four dives. That's pretty much the difference. It's about maybe one weekend. So, as as the non instructor in the, in the group, if I were a new diver hearing that, I'd be like, well, why not just go for open water diver and just take a longer class? Uh, and that may not be how you sell it, Nicole, but that's how it sounds to me as you describe it. So, uh, I you I can think do that it. We have two, it. It no, no, depends I on how much you want to be unsupervised and how much that matters to you. If if you in, you have to as taste as in, diving first. But as a person that knows nothing about diving other than on the Discovery Channel, I am I'm looking to you to give me that guidance. So as, I, as a person as how, who knows nothing about diving, you come into my shop and I'm going to make you purchase all this equipment, and I'm going to say no, that the only you don't have to purchase equipment when you take your course. Absolutely. So that's, that's unique because not every shop has that policy. Don't have to. 
most of the shops around here in my neck of the woods require the purchase of gear when you that's take a course. That's not a standard. That's a business gear, decision. Is that the mass fit? I agree. Weight type of, is that the your personal gear type of situation? Where it's mass fin, snorkel, maybe dive weights, weight belt type uh, sure. gloves and booties. That sure. that that type of stuff. I, sure. So I think having personally, I would rather have a shop say to me, "Hey, Eric, we're going to have you go through a six week or an eight week class, and at the end of that class, we're, you're going to be comfortable in the water diving to sixty feet." We also want you to then come join us on these local dives. So we're going to give you a, a, a quote unquote membership in your in our dive club. That's what we do. All that's all that's going to do is give you some access to some other divers that dive regularly locally. And I think you can maybe find a buddy if you don't have one, or, or find a mentor if you don't have one. I think, but going back to what Jason said, of the, and I think Nicole, you mentioned it too, the two different categories. We have your people that want this as a bucket list item. And that's a different type of person. At the end of the day, they just want to pay money, get a card, and move on. And then you have the person that says, hey, I fell in love with diving. I want to dive because I saw it at Epcot. I saw it on Discovery Channel. I feel some connection to this sport. And I want to be able to be feel one with the ocean, be it marine life, be it photography. You you pick your whatever you what what drew you to diving. And those are the people that we want to keep and retain as long living, as long time divers for decades. And as an industry, I think we try to pick and choose. I think we want everyone to be at that $200, get you in and out in three days. But then we expect those people to just buy class after class after class. And then learn, especially if you get into the technical realm, what do you do in the first technical class? You unlearn everything you learned in your open water diving. And that's something that to this day, I still have to unlearn stuff I learned in my open water classes. And and that makes my technical training not challenging, but adds another wrinkle to it. If I learned every if I did things today that I learned back then if I learned if I could dive today like I did back in the day, I'd have a much better experience in my technical diving world. Um, I think as an industry we have to pick we can't pick we we try to put everyone in one bucket, but we have to pick and choose who those divers are. And I think we have to pick two different tracks in how we train those divers. Yeah. So that's, that's the standpoint we made is essentially, you know, Hey, we're, we want to spend time with the people who, who want to continue on with this. And, and we might lose some people that would have possibly stayed on, but we spend more meaningful time with less quantity of people, but a higher quality of, of time with those people. We sit down and we, even open water, we sit down and have a nice long conversation whether they're going to match with our instructor style. And, and we, if not, we give recommendations to the other shops to go to um, if they're looking for, something different um i do it all the time with technical diving there it's it's yeah it's kind of invite only on the technical thing uh, so you know we have to have a sit down long conversation about whether we're going to match or not in in instruction and so that we can really match with our students and create quality instruction as opposed to quantity our class size is two to four maybe um tops because that's what's going to produce a really good diver but even us, we're we're priced too low for what we are because there's no way we can compete against the pricing structure that that these people have that that are just running cheap classes compared to. And but you're, so, <clears throat> so your your modern day consumer does not want to spend money or time. That is the reason that people aren't diving. So your answer to that is to make classes that last longer and cost more. If so, if we said that people weren't becoming doctors because they don't want to spend the time to learn how to be a doctor and we want to make it so that it's easier to be a doctor, that doesn't mean we have a bunch of good doctors. We just have more doctors. That's it. Yeah. You know, so I've we want more. So we, but we don't need good scuba divers. Look, I'm not saying, I'm Wait, not what? saying. Wait, what? I, we want more what, divers. What did I just because, hear? We don't want more scu good scuba divers. I would rather have more as as someone that I would rather have see better divers in the water that are comfortable that don't have that look of fear Thank you. in their mouth. But if you have more divers that are comfortable, you want more divers that are comfortable, which means if they want to dive with a professional, they can dive with a professional. And if they want to upgrade it, then they can upgrade and not dive with a professional. Now, you are telling me that um, you're telling me that we're losing customers to these to these businesses that are doing these cheap and easy courses 
Um, they don't have to be low quality courses. I really want you guys to stop believing the myth that this course will leave them any less prepared than the open water diver course. Whoa, all I oh, see is people. All I, uh, and what is your and where is your proof? Because um, we have less divers. Three and years as a forensic dive accident investigator, and also eight years within a national scuba training. Of course, agency. but that's biased. I've as a as a forensic dive uh, accident investigator, you're only going to see the dive accidents. You're not going to see all the successful dives. That's biased. Uh, thousands of divers that I've taught. Yes, I've seen. What I'm what I'm going to point you to or towards is the statistics, which is. Most people who do an entry level scuba diving course will continue to go on and take more courses. Uh, I can tell you it's more than 60%. Let's see the exact percentage. Uh, uh, Nicole, I'm sorry, you're 60%. not actually saying whether or not those people went through an abbreviated course or a regular. But they chose course. to continue that's diving. Not in those, they that's chose not to continue their statistics. Their, so because it's not in those statistics, you can't use that to support. I'm curious you know, about those people do that. The, a second course after that, because the number of times that instructors shove down advanced open water the next weekend skews that completely. I see a whole lot of instructors that say, I've got the best continuing education percentages in the world because I sold the advanced open water the next weekend because they're scared shitless on the fact that they can't dive. So they come back the next weekend and take advanced open water. They're still not a good diver. And then they quit the sport. I see that all the time. I hear about it. I see it. They come to my so shop. So why are we forcing people to do open water diver? And then their next course is an advanced open water diver. I think we both agreed that people with because eight dives bigger. should not be considered advanced, right, but because, because they need more training and they're scared, they go to the advanced course. Right. Because uh, we did a poor job instructing them and it's linear on the infographic that certain organizations put out. It is the next step. It is in the special color. It goes from this color is in the line and it goes this step to this step and it never addresses the educational component. So what, they need. what if we gave them what they wanted, which is just get your, get your feet wet Go into scuba diving. See if you like it first before you commit to having Most to purchase people call all this that gear. Discover scuba. Yep. Most I don't. I don't start my programs with discover scuba. But if they're going to do discover scuba, the they're going to do. That are literally the words for the description of a discover scuba well, class. Why would you do a discover scuba if you could do a supervised diver course, which is? Why would you do a supervised scuba diver course if you could do open water diving? Because it's you a see, certification, and now I can dive for life, as opposed to a discover scuba, scuba which is not a certification. Discover scuba. So I so, almost try scuba so, and see if you like it. Just, is discover? Just, just no. I, I don't believe in discover scuba. I believe in just giving them a certification that allows them to dive to well, become divers. So, if you so do discover I, scuba. <laughs> I almost think well, so. that's bias right there. There are <laughs> many people that don't know if scuba is right for them. And so why not give them a certification and allow them to dive supervised? And if they decide that they want to continue diving, they can get they can upgrade. Mm. So I almost think we have to take uh, a couple steps backwards. Um, one, I think some of the, the larger industries want to make diving available for everyone. I think we, we kind of have to, as an industry, really discuss is diving right for everyone. And I personally think the answer is no. Um, that well, also means the standard. Hold on. So, when we talk well, about well, people well, no. making diving well, accessible well. to everyone, we're not well. talking about we're talking about making it accessible to different types of people. No, 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 no. Not no. What just... I mean, no, no. From a standards perspective, if you say my goal is to make everyone of, that wants to dive able to be certified as a diver, that means your standards go to a very low level because you want people to be certified. I also think, at at the end of the day, the we have to be honest with people when they get out of that class, be like, congratulations, here's your certification card. Now you're comfortable to dive to 30 to 60 feet. We say you can dive to 130, but we don't, but at the end of the day, do you want to be comfortable as a new diver coming out of your scuba certification class, jumping down to 130? We don't talk about those things. I, you know, and, and hearing this discussion tonight, I almost think we have to look at Again, it's the instructor. At what point should someone become certified as an instructor? Is it 100 dies? I think no. But I think 500 dies? Possibly. But at the end of the day, you want to have some type of a pipeline where the person training the new diver that has no concept of what diving is or the, and they're looking up to that person as they know everything actually has a good frame of reference about different things within the diving realm. Um, I, 
I almost think we have to really look at how we train people, but also once they get that card, what they do after the fact. Is it mentoring? I'm a big fan of mentoring. Is it local diving or, or travel? You pick it, but we so have to keep that person So what's the difference between engaged. mentoring and supervision? Because that mentor may not be an instructor. That mentor may be someone that has a higher Understood. level certification than you. Um, mentoring could, that, that's how I look at mentoring. Eric, who are your mentors? Uh, let's see. Um, George Place Nancy, and his wife, Nancy. Um, Terrence Tyson, when I did my cave training. Um, now I'd say uh, Ed Hayes mm -hmm. and some of the guy and uh, and and some of those guys. I I've been lucky. I've had a bunch of different mentors along my diving career or my diving education that have that have shown me different ways of to dive, and and the value and the things that they showed me weren't things I learned in a class. It was everything after the class, and it was also showing me how to act in the water, and that was yeah. the important thing. They made it very clear: is here's your card. Don't think you know what you're doing today. This gives you a key to learn to become a better diver. When I got my cave certification, Terrence made it very clear to me, you're not, you're a full cave diver by certification, but don't think you're a full cave diver yet. You haven't done enough dives to become a cave diver mm -hmm. until you get more so, training so, in the water. So we agree that when, let's start with where we agree. And we agree that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't go from advanced, uh, from open water to advanced because you no, still need no, more no. training. We agree with that, right? Yeah, I don't even teach advanced. We agree that after you get your CAVE certification, you're probably not ready to, you, you may not feel comfortable being a full CAVE diver yet. That's what I just heard from Eric. He made it very clear. So I can't go do exploration as a full CAVE diver. I can go okay. on the main line, I can dive. But he, well, I think what I'm trying to get across is they made it clear that you have now this ability to keep continued learning. And I think that's the piece that maybe isn't always expressed to the new student. Here's your certification card. Continue to learn. Learn by either taking classes or mentoring or continue to dive with people that you want to dive with and have fun. I think it's what I have seen. Again, I don't instruct. What I've seen from shops is here's your advanced open water card. Here's your open water card. Here, let's get you in that advanced class the next week. Here's four specialties. Congratulations. Here's your advanced open water class with your four specialties. Here's your dive master class. I want to keep you training because I get money off of the classes. Not saying so, everyone does that, but I've seen that. But that's at perfect. no point do people have fun. And we lose that as an industry is we make people enjoy themselves in the water first and then come back for that training because they're having fun in the water. So for me, that's exactly what I'm just trying to advocate. And I think I got a little misunderstood. My entry level, uh, diver course is exactly that. You're qualified to start and you're qualified to start gaining experience uh, and you have a card. So you belong in the diver club. Okay. And if you want to learn more, you are welcome to do so. And, and that being, you, you can always adjust the way you price these things so that taking an extra course now that they want to be spread their wings and fly on their own, plan their own dives, that should that, that shouldn't have to be a price, you know. You can always adjust it. It's just I'm just reimagining how I'm break how I'm welcoming new divers into the world, and I'm just giving them an extra step, so they don't have to take a giant leap because we're expecting these people to take this giant leap up that ladder as their first step, and sometimes it's hard to take that giant. It, it's a lot of effort on our part, and it's a lot of effort on the students' part. So we're just introduced a little wrong. That's basically the summary. Okay. Tech, Eric, other comments? No, I, I mean, it's, I think it's been a lively, a, a great yeah, discussion. No, you I, haven't I, even I, seen the comments yeah. yet. I, they're, they're too long. I can't even put them up. It just covers you guys. So there's a whole lot of comments issues that we got to, that, <laughs> that have to be unpacked. I mean, there, I tried putting some up. It just covers everybody up on the bottom of the screen. People are writing novels, so. Ah, uh, Danny's not a real diver because he doesn't like freshwater diving, and freshwater that's, diving's awesome. That's that is a dig on me. Well, that is. That... I, I will. I will say this just to uh, just to clarify. You know, I know we've spent a lot of time talking about a supervised diver model and things like that, but I think that what's super important is to understand the consumerism behavior that Nicole was talking about earlier. It's truly a behavior. We all do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we want uh, we want Amazon Prime. We want 
the thing the that we go for and we want it as cheap and quick as possible. This is consumerism at its core. And that is by definition what we're all doing. And we get it, right? Unfortunately, what has happened over the years is that the scuba certification agencies have come along to create more of a consumer product called the C-Card. And the C-Card is what you need to be able to dive and to get equipment and things like that. So now what happens is that the students look at the C-Card as what they need to be able to dive. It's not about the course. It's not about the length of time. It's not about being a good diver. It's about getting the card to be able to dive. That then produces consumerism. They're only looking at the card. If we talked about golf lessons, it would be a completely different story. Someone would be like, no, I don't want the cheapest and quickest golf lessons. I want to be a good golfer. So they go take lessons for becoming a good golfer, not to get a card to golf. They're completely different models. And that is what we're up against. And what happens is you guys are in some territories where there's not the same competition that we have down here in Fort Lauderdale, where there's dive shops on every street corner mm -hmm. and everybody is competing. And when they're competing down here to get the consumer, what they're doing is using the scuba class as the loss leader. The loss leader is I'm going to give it to you as cheap and quick as possible so that I don't lose money on the class. That's how I do uh, what the people are saying. That's how they do the $99 courses or the Groupon courses like Jason was talking about. And what takes place there is that that comes in. That's the consumer mindset. I'm going to get it cheap and quick. And the problem is is that the training then is cheap and quick because it's pulled down and it's suppressed to match those prices and what do they do in return that's where you see the model nicole of the shops pushing the equipment sales because that's where they're making their money that's where the greatest margins are not on training but on the equipment sales i don't touch equipment model remember oh did, were, were you there no. And so that's just, that is what is literally crushing the quality of our industry. I'll send you uh, I'll send you my e-learning. If you think it's a bad, if it's a low, I think that my supervised diver e-learning is higher quality than most of the open water standards in the industry right now. Wait, wait, wait. I, I don't want to argue e-learning. E-learning is phenomenal. It's a great teaching tool. And there's so that's a lot what I mean people, when I say cheap. Hang on, please listen. There's a lot of people that talk about that e-learning as a substitute to classroom time. That you know, oh, it's the worst thing ever. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. There is the downside of student contact hours, but the fact is, is that sometimes, in some cases, the e-learning is actually a superior learning tool to a certain instructor. So I will absolutely agree with you there. <laughs> I Nicole. like that. <laughs> okay. So you've got my vote on e-learning. Well, that's the just what I meant is, by is cheap. The problem is e-learning is not where the huge cost center is. In some agencies, okay, one agency, e-learning is super high priced. In many other agencies, e-learning is not at all a cost factor that is significant. Where there's a huge cost factor is the contact hours in the pool sessions, the rental of the pool time, and the money that you're going to spend on the pool, the pool instructor, and possibly a dive master or whatever to put on that course. And that is where we're seeing the suppression. It's not the academics. It's the skill sets. That's what we're witnessing on the dive boats. It's the skill sets that are horrible because of the suppression of the pool and confined water training. So I'm with you, Nicole. E-learning has its place in our industry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's so just I what you? I meant by cheap. Mm -hmm. Costs and uh, saves costs. As the non-instructor in the group, if I were to book one of you for an hour in a book pool me. or a quarry, or I'm great. any one of you, you're all <laughs> awesome. What would your hourly rate be? I'm just curious. What would you charge a student to, to maybe do like a refresher and, or just go dive with them in the pool, to do skills and drills? What do you have an hourly rate or what, what would you yes. charge a, a student? So let me see. I do coaching and it is 
I will post up the pricing for it um, in a second, but it is per day and per half day is how we end up doing it. I got to find my pricing on that. Do you do um, eight hour day or four hour day? Is that how you- It's it's an eight hour day, but you can split it in half and you can split it with other people. Um, and it's about, um, I think about $400 a day per for me is about where okay. I'm at. I feel like it's a little tough to talk about 300, price sorry. because I, he, I believe Jason's upstate tech, you're in Florida and I'm in New York city where an hour of swimming pool costs $200. So to totally understood. And I guess what my question more was as, as an industry, we, we devalue the training component and especially on the open water level, a lot of instructors make very little per student for the amount of time they put in from what I have seen. Mm -hmm and from my experience of talking with instructors. So that's where I was kind of going with it. Like as it, if the instructor, if you're trying to churn students through, or if as an industry, we value the gear sales first, get them in the door, that initial class dollar amount pay for the C card. Again, getting that C card, but not the training that gets you to that C card becomes important. The training itself is devalued. And as an industry, we have to reevaluate re how we do that. Maybe it's, I mean, as, as as someone who's gone through different instructors having different types of training, I would rather go through a class and be told, and I've been told in my classes, this it's the training first. You may or may not get a certification. There's no guarantee unless you pass and meet my standards, which are the minimums plus whatever the, the threshold is. And I like hearing that because if, if you go into a class thinking, I'm going to get my card because I paid my $500, for, uh, for lack of a better term, there's no incentive for you to do well in the class because you know at the end of the day, you're going to get whatever certification you've signed up for. But if you say, hey, you met the standard, but I don't think you're ready for the clap, for the card, come back. That means I need to improve my skills. And I'd rather hear that from an instructor. This assume I finished my one day class. Here's your card. You think you're certified. You think you're proficient, which is, I think, better, a better word than certification. You're proficient in whatever that skill may be. And you're actually not. And at the end of the day, you jump in the water, be it in North Carolina or the Northeast or Florida or wherever, and you actually think you're you're at a more a higher proficiency level than you are. And now as a diver, you think, crap, I can do, I can go beyond that. I can be more comfortable and you're not. And you finish your dive and you didn't have a good time. You actually were scared shitless, but you finished your dive because you were told you were certified to do that type of diving. I see that more often than I don't. <laughs> All right. Well, we have essentially come first full circle and we've gone past our normal hour. So uh, I'm going to wrap this up. And we kind of came back and, and to, to Eric's point of he, he brought it back to the fact that each dive shop uses different loss leaders. And if people are smart and they're shopping around, our entire industry collapses because they're going to go to every dive shop, make sure that no one ever can pay their rent, essentially. And the entire thing collapses in is is essentially what will end up happening. And we watch people do it around here. Um, so. We have a lot of work. I like what you were saying, Eric, about the uh, increased number of dives. It, it's we've for an instructor. We, there's a lot of stuff we hashed out, and there are a ton of comments, um, mostly on Facebook. But uh, look in there, and there's plenty to have a conversation about. Um, closing remarks. We'll go backwards. Tech closing remarks. Well, dear goodness. I mean, I haven't seen the comments. I'm sure that there's going to be people that are like, um, you know, you're a tool. Uh, you're, I, I took my weekend scuba course and I'm a perfectly fine diver. No, it's not that. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. Well, I, I think that there are some people that say that. But, um, the, you know, the thing is, is that from my perspective, and I've been blessed with having a career in this industry at a, at very high levels, and looking down, there is definitely room for improvement in our industry, and the training agencies are not really supervising very much those dive centers. Um, my last podcast episode was about mm -hmm. a dive center that advertised a two-hour two hours in the pool for an open water diver course to which they corrected after the podcast and moved up to 3.5 hours. So 88 skills in the confined water course over five confined water pool sessions in 210 minutes. 
sorry, my just setting up the gear is a 45 <laughs> minute presentation just to set up mm -hmm. the gear. The swim test is a 10 minute tread, 10 minutes on a 200 yard swim, a few breaks in between. That's 24 minutes right there. Mm -hmm. So you look at this and there's really some egregious problems that are happening there. The best thing that I can leave in parting comments is that individuals really need to understand what they're getting into for, for whatever they pursue in diving. And they really need to do some good homework and research on the instructors and the dive centers that they're going to go with. And it's not about cheap and it's not about quick. It's absolutely this sport, especially since your body is not meant to be underwater. You need the technique and the technology to do that. And because of that, because this is life support equipment underwater in an environment that we're not supposed to be in, why would we be discounting the training side of this in low in water time, low in water practice, low contact hours with our students? That's a challenge for me. Eric. <laughs> well, on that note, I, I, I like what Tech said. I, I, I think at the end of the day, I think as, as the non-instructor, as an industry, we have to figure out how we want to train our students to keep them engaged and staying in the sport. And that's more, con I, I think more contact hours and be upfront with that student. And if the student wants to do Jason's Instagram story style, well, that's a different track. Hey, it's not my style. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Okay. Your example. Sorry. Your example. My apologies. Yes. <laughs> but I think we have to be honest with the students say, okay, that's what you want to do. Here's how we're going to train you. You like diving. You want to be engaged. You want to learn. You have that passion. You feel like you do. Here's the track we want to take you. And I think we have to be upfront and honest. And we also have to look at it. What industries do we compare ourselves to? Are we the skydive? We compare ourselves to skydiving or golf? Personally, I think we have to look towards skydiving. Humans shouldn't be jumping out of planes, and that's not a natural environment for us to be in. We shouldn't be under the water without technology and training. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, Nicole, close your remarks. All right. Well, um, to summarize, I think that our industry is suffering. I think every year we get fewer open. We we get fewer new divers coming in and it's a trend. Um, and diving is a very exclusive sport. And if we continue trying to, f there is an Amazon mindset in our consumers and we might not like it, I don't like it. Um, but if we continue trying to fight it and resist it and pretend it's not there, it's not going to go away. So it we need to be creative and if, and we need to adapt the standards. We have to reimagine what an open water, uh, what a new diver looks like. And if you think that, if people think that that means it has to be low, low hours and poor quality courses, I think that's unimaginative. I think that we need to be resourceful as an industry and we need to think how the heck can we welcome new divers Um in ways that are safe and that keep people feeling comfortable diving and wanting to dive more. Good. Well put. Uh, yes. All right. Thank you very much to all three of you guys. I am going to say goodbye to uh, whoever, well, actually we still we have like 34 people still up in this piece. So uh, you guys can feel free to dabble in the remarks there on the comments. Uh, like I said, most of it's on Facebook and it's posted on YouTube too. But um, so uh, thank you very much. I'll pull you guys out. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Thanks guys. See you. Bye. Bye, guys. All right, guys. Thank you very much for tuning into uh, another show of Drama Diving. This was excellent. Uh, thank you very much for all the comments. Uh, we're going to move through those at some point in time uh, and uh, try to make some commentary in there. I really appreciate all your guys' help. Uh, as always, um, we would appreciate uh, any help you can give us on Patreon uh, and just your general support is amazing. I will post up the links for Patreon. Uh, we appreciate it. And you have a wonderful night. Thanks again for everything, guys. Take care.